So uh, good morning to everybody. A pleasant day to all of you, my dear um, brethren. It's really nice to, um, to see you again. It was almost a year um, when I was with you. And I want to thank all of you for making me uh, feel right at home when I was there with you. I was um, really like, uh, like in my home congregation. The atmosphere, the singing, you know, the fellowship. Oh, and I got my own souvenir as well. Uh, I have it here with me, and I, I did ask uh, Brother Derek you know, if I can uh, keep this as a uh, safe keep. Uh, safe keep. Uh, so it's still um, working, still have its, its ink in it, and um, my own uh, East Foothill Church of Christ pen. <laughs> you know, my dear brethren, in this trying time, you know, requests for prayers keep coming in, requests for spiritual counseling was in its highest i've been talking to friends about their worries caused by this pandemic almost on a daily basis not only do we have to deal with this covid 19 virus but we also have to deal with the economic crisis the civil unrest among other things many of us today are enveloped with fears and worries with what is happening globally we don't know when this pandemic will come to an end and when we can go back to our so-called normal life. Today, we're going to talk about faith in relation to what's going on around us and in the context of our fears and our worries. Just like what the uh, scripture reading uh, was read a while ago, let me just go over it and uh, let me just go and read it again. One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. And they ceased, and there was calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? Now, Jesus said, where is your faith? In times like this, it is easy to shrink back and lose our faith. Even a seasoned faithful sometimes find himself questioning his faith and the existence of God. But in times like this as well, where a storm is raging on us, this COVID-19 you know, looms around us that our faith will be put to test if it, to see if how strong and deeply rooted our faith in Jesus is. According to a research, 38% of people fear and worry too much. And guess what? A huge percentage of people worry even small things like what to wear going to an event even that is getting into their nerves. You know, the Lord is right. We even worry of what we are going to wear. Worrying too much is very much harmful both to our physical and mental health. Here's just some interesting facts about worry, according to one of the website that I saw, that revealed that it is early in the morning and late in the evening are the most common times people worry. Financial housing and worries top the list of people from age 25 to 44. Women in the study tend to worry about relationships and health. Men, on the other hand, tend to worry about work. People who are single, separated, or divorced tend to worry about finances and housing. Managers have more symptoms of excessive worry than workers. They are, they are more prone to anxiety and depressions. And we worry as we age in life. You know, Jesus asked, where is your faith? You know, I had a very interesting encounter about where my faith is. Last year, I was with you. The story behind that, what transpired before I got my visa was a matter of where is your faith. I would just like to tell you the story as quickly as I can. You know, every year, 
the Alongapo Filipino community in San Diego celebrate its uh, Filipino fiesta. And last year, it was held in National City from August 27 to September 3. And every year, local government officials and businessmen here in Alongapo are invited to grace the occasion. Last year, our council was fortunate enough to be invited. So me and my colleague immediately applied online for our visa and waited for our interview date. For some reason, my colleague got an earlier date for interview than I am. Their interview, I think, was set August 5. I was hopeful that all of them will pass and be given visa because for one, they all have travel history. Me, I never had any travel abroad. And two, they're all well off and they have financial documents to support. Unfortunately, all of them were denied visa. You know, when I got my interview date, guess what? It was September 15, way past the event. The event was August 27 to September 3. I was telling myself, how can I be given a visa if the event was already over? The consul would just tell me, you have no more reason to go there because the event was all over. You know, that thought alone was trying to weary me down and I was trying so hard to think on what to say to the consul come face to face with him. I did thought of rescheduling the interview for, for this year, you know, just wait for another invitation. For I know I will definitely be denied of my visa application. As days passes, there was a voice at the back of my head saying to go ahead with my scheduled interview and just tell the console what really happened and leave it all up to God. And then the D-Day has arrived. Approaching the embassy, I was so really nervous. I thought I was going to have a uh, heart attack. My heart was beating so fast. I was telling God, Lord, calm me down and we can do this. Nothing is impossible with you. And here comes the moment of truth. Facing the console, I was relaxed with my usual casual smile and I greeted the console and asked him how his day was. And he answered back and he started firing away with his questions and I was firing back with my answers. There was this one question when he asked, have you ever traveled outside the Philippines? And I said, yes. And that is with conviction. I said, yes. And he asked me, where? I told him, Cebu, Davao. And I was like, oh no, I blew it. <laughs> I blew it. And the consul told me, that's not outside the Philippines. That is inside the Philippines. And I told him, I'm sorry, I made the wrong answer. I was thinking inside the Philippines. And I told him I never traveled outside of the Philippines. I know he was trying to laugh, but he was just keeping it to himself. Now, the person beside me and the person at my back, they were all smiling at me. And I was smiling and laughing a bit at my mistake. Then finally, he asked for my passport and told me, wait for five days and he will mail it to me with my visa. And I was like, wow. I was telling myself that time, Mike, relax, keep composed, don't shout for joy. But you know, deep inside of me, I was shouting. I was celebrating, jumping up and down. I was thanking God. Going outside the embassy, you know, I sat down for a while. The first thing I remember I said to God was, Lord, I am sorry I doubted. And the very words he said to his disciples rings to my ear that day. Where is your faith? Mike, where is your faith? For many, it seems like it's not a big deal. But for me and for us Christians, it is a big deal for all we must live by faith. You know, that experience, Jesus taught me a great lesson about faith. And today, we will talk about faith. When our lives are being battered by storm, when we are facing trials of many kinds, where we are in doubts of some sort, there are actually two things that we can do. 
Number one, we follow what the Lord told us to do. To consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, wherein the testing of our faith produces perseverance, James chapter 1, verse 2. Or number two, we can all break down running and trembling with fears and worries with our doubts, questioning and losing our faith. When this happens, when our fears and worries overwhelm us, then we will hear the voice of Jesus asking us, where is your faith? This question, where is your faith, really is, do we hide it in our closet? Do we leave it at home You know, when we go out? Or do we leave it in the church building after every Sunday worship service? Or do we bring it with us always? Let us see faith in two perspectives, the two sides of faith. We all know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. In Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 16, I will just go over it for a while. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut down and he shut the, the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you your majesty. Now, if we're going to picture, if you will picture out in your mind and draw it out, how would you draw Daniel inside the lion's den? How do you picture Daniel inside the lion's den? I'm guessing that you will have Daniel either standing up or sitting down, praying to God with the lions around him, getting ready for a sumptuous meal. Interestingly enough, if you Google, if you type it, Google it, type Daniel in the lion's den, that is exactly what you will see. Most people see it that way, Daniel looking up to God and praying to God, and the lion looking to Daniel. Now, for just a moment, we will leave Daniel behind, but I just want you to have that picture at the back of your head. And let us go to the account of Peter when he walks on water. In Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus came to his disciples walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and cried out, It's a ghost! And they screamed in terror, Have courage! Jesus immediately told them, it's me. Stop being afraid. Then Peter answered, answered him, Lord, if it is you, order me to come to you on the water. Then Jesus said, come on. Come on, Peter. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind and the waves, he was frightened. As he began to sink, he shouted, Lord, save me. At once, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him, and asked him, you who have little faith, why do you doubt? Here, my dear brethren, we have a picture of Peter looking at the strong wind and the waves and being terrified of it, and he began to sink. The stories will tell us of where our faith is, Two contrasting stories, the story of Peter and the story of Daniel. The story of Peter looking to Jesus initially, but when he saw the great wind, he was terrified and began to sink. That's what will happen when our fears overwhelm us. What our fear does is it eats up, devours our faith. It blocks our eyes to see Jesus. And the moment we take our eyes off Jesus and focuses 
on our fears, we will sink. We will get into more trouble. Now, we look at Daniel. He was looking up to God. He was praying to God. He was not looking at the lion. His faith is focused on God and not on his fears. When we are focused on our faith, miracles do happen. Good things happen. Do you believe that? Amen to that. The angel of God shut down the lion's mouth. I want all of us to starve our fears and start feeding our faith. When you feed your faith, you will starve your fear. But how do we feed our faith? Know the truth, hold on to the truth, believe the truth, and practice the truth. Know the truth. If you are constantly bothered by a lamp or a mass on your body, for example, being worried all the time, thinking of it, if it is benign or cancerous, won't do you any good. What you should do is have it checked out. Have a biopsy to finally know the answer. Know the truth. By knowing the truth, you eliminate doubts and worries. Hold on to the truth. Once you know the truth, never argue the truth in your mind. By knowing that it is not cancerous, you can sleep better at night. Don't ever go back and entertain your doubts that it may be cancerous. Believe the truth. Believing the truth is twofold. Number one, you will believe the truth based on your personal knowledge and information. For example, one plus one equals two. You will believe it because of your personal knowledge. If someone comes up to you and tells you one plus one equals five, you won't believe that. Because your personal knowledge and information will tell you that one plus one equals two. So you will believe the truth based on your personal knowledge and information. Number two, the second fold, you will believe the truth based on your trust level. Based on your trust level. For example, if Brother Charles will come up to me and say, Brother Mike, one plus one equals four, even if my trust level on him is high, I will not believe him. Why? I will, I will have to go back to the first fold First and foremost, a person will have to believe in himself based on his knowledge. And my knowledge tells me that one plus one isn't four, but two. But if Brother Charles is a doctor and he tells me that my lamp is benign, then I would believe him based on his credentials and being my brother in Christ and because I am not a doctor. The number four, practice the truth. In order for me to live a healthy and longer life, I need to take the advices of Brother Charles being a doctor. I need to practice it. I need to do it. So feeding your faith is knowing the truth, holding on to the truth, believing the truth, and practicing the truth. Now, what is the truth? The truth is here on earth, while we have many trials and sorrows, we will have tribulations according to Jesus himself in John chapter 16, verse 33. We are not free of problems. It is not all beds of roses. We must learn to accept that bad times will come. And here's another truth. Want to hear the good news? The good news is that Jesus, Jesus said, but take heart, take courage, because I have overcome the world. Wow. Wow. Hallelujah to that. Isn't that comforting enough for all of us to hear that Jesus overcomes the world? It includes your fears. It includes your worries. He took care of it all. Oh, before I forget, and even death, Jesus conquered death. He took care of it so that he can give you and I life. That is eternal life with him in heaven. And here's another truth. Well, are you ready for another good news? Another good news is, let's go ahead and read that in John chapter 16, verse 32. John 16, 32. The Bible said, Look, an hour is coming and has already come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, 
and you will leave me alone. Yet, I am not alone because the Father is with me. We thought that Jesus is alone during his trying time, but no, his Father is with him. The good news is, you think that you are all alone in your battle. We are dead wrong, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is with you. God the Father is with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. The Trillion God is with you. And how amazing is that? Whatever struggles and battles you are fighting now, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You need only to be calm. Exodus 14, 14. The reason why Jesus said all of this, that he is not alone and that you are not alone, in verse 33 of John chapter 16, let's continue reading that. I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Jesus said that you may have peace in me. Your faith in Jesus will bring you peace, comfort, and assurance. Jesus said, peace in me, not peace on someone else. Because someone else are bound to fail you. Jesus will never fail you. That is your faith in Jesus, focusing on him and not on your fears. You know, by focusing on these truths, holding on to it, and living by it, you are feeding your faith. We are feeding our faith. You are strengthening your faith, and your fear will start to starve. Now you will have a faith that is greater than your fear. Now what is faith in the context of our fears and worries? The Bible defined faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And part of that confidence in what we hope for is God's deliverance in times that our lives are being battered by great winds. In times that we have, like what we are having now, like we have this pandemic, we hold on to the promise of God that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. Remember that the righteous person, you and I, may have many troubles, but the Lord, now listen to this, but the Lord delivers us from them all. Psalm chapter 34, verse 19. Our faith tell us to cling on to the promise of God no matter what. Let not our fears take away our focus on Jesus. On the contrary, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Not like Peter, he took his eyes off Jesus and what happened next is more trouble. Life would be more miserable, and we don't like life to be miserable. When our fears takes away our faith from us, it takes away Jesus from us. Then Jesus will ask us, where is your faith? Where am I in your life? Am I not in the same boat with you? Or did you toss me away? Remember that Jesus was in the same boat with the apostles and still they lose their faith. God, again, did not promise beds of roses to all those who serve him. But what God promises is that he will deliver us. He will deliver you and I from our worries and our fears. It is in the midst of this trying time that our faith will be tested, that our faith will be put to test if it is genuine or not, like gold being tested by fire and purifies it. Now, having been tested as genuine faith, it doesn't matter where you are planted because we are deeply rooted in Christ in our lives and our lives are built upon him in Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. Now, let us all realize, my dear brothers and sisters, and help 
me spread this good news of the Lord. That life is such a full of blessings. I remember, you know, reading this quote on one of my uh, test paper or exam paper when I was in high school. <clears throat> and it read, I keep on complaining I have no shoes until I saw a man without any feet. You know, when we focus on our fears, it deprives God of our gratitudes for all His blessings because, because all that we see and what fear wants us to see is the things that you don't have and those things that you want, the things we complain about, those things that worries us. Life is so much full of blessings that we are just so blinded by our worries and our fears that we don't see them. Maybe we are worried that we lost our jobs. But, you know, if we look around carefully and in other places, people are not just losing their jobs. They are losing their lives as well because of poverty. Sometimes we worry so much that if we look and compare our lives with our neighbors, we will see that we are so blessed and have so much in life that our neighbors, our friends, your friends, your family members almost have none. We worry that we don't have much to share for dinner tonight. But if we look at our neighbors, probably they have not eaten for two or three days. Now, let me tell you quickly about the story about these two farmers. After tilling the soil the whole morning, the two, farmer, the two farmers eat their lunch. And after eating, both take the rest under a java plum tree. The fruit of this java plum tree is just as small as this. And when it's, it is ripe, the color is black. You know, After about 10 minutes in their, in their rest, the java plum fruit fell onto the two farmers' head. It hits them on their head and waking them up from their needed rest. The first farmer was so furious and he was cursing you know, because he was awakened from a much needed rest. Now, the second farmer was just casual and asked the first farmer, why, why are you so angry at the plum? And he goes on to say that they should be thankful to God instead. You know, the first farmer asked the second one, why should I be thankful to God? You know, the second farmer said, you know, can you imagine? Can you imagine? He was telling to the first farmer that was cursing. Now, can you imagine, my friend, if God made this plum fruit as big as a coconut fruit and fell on our heads, we might be probably dead and you won't have the time to be furious and to be cursing. You know, it's really easy for us, my dear brothers and sisters, to run our mouth, you know, to run our mouth and complain. Let us be mindful of God's blessings to us. Every day that you and I are alive, that's a wonderful blessing in itself. We have so much more to thank God for than to worry or complain about. Now try to count your blessings and name them one by one if you can. We need to see things on a different perspective sometimes. Remember, are we not more important than the lilies and the birds? Can we add a single minute in our lives by worrying? Faith in the context of our fears and worries is telling us to be dependent on God for his provisions, protections, and deliverance. Instead of fear, have faith. Instead of worries, be thankful. Life will never be in darkness if we truly have Jesus in our lives. Because as Jesus said in Matthew 13, 43, then the righteous will shine like the sun. Wherever we are planted, we will never fear because we are deeply rooted up in Christ. My dear brethren in Christ, let us keep the faith, stay safe, stay blessed, Godspeed, and good morning to everybody. Thank you.